Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today's the second Sunday of the month, which means it's time for Nutrition Insights with Peter Rogers, MD. And today he's going to be talking about Western abdominal diseases. And he should know because I think he's read over about 10,000 of these abdominal CT scans in his career. Please welcome him to the show. Hi, Dr. Rogers. How are you? Hi, good. Good. Wow. This is a quite a drawing. I, I I hope one day if I ever play Pictionary, you're on my team. <laughs> yeah, this is basically uh, Dennis Burkett's abdominal pressure syndrome. Nice. Nice. Wow. So you, is that you, you do a lot of procedures at what, what is the most common one you see? Well, 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 I mean, as far as procedures, just looking at this film, like what would be the most common thing I would do a procedure on these patients right here? Yeah, I used to do a lot of abscess drainages. I did tons and tons of abscess drainages, diverticulitis, for appendicitis, you know, for other surgical complex patients, Crohn's disease, you know, post-op abscesses, uh, all that kind of stuff. Wow. Well, all these things in the slide are things that Dennis Burkett never really saw. Well, he, he never saw these in the plant-based populations when he was working in Africa, but he saw them in all the Western persons who were out there still eating the Western diet. And he had seen them previously when he had worked in England. Interesting. So that's, that's very telling. Do you want me to start? Oh, please start your presentation. Enjoy okay. everyone. So basically what fiber does is it pulls water into the stool. So it makes the stool liquefied. Normally the stool should be liquefied on the right side of the colon. But most modern Americans eat very little fiber. Dennis Burkett felt we should be eating 100 grams a day or more. Average American only eats about 10. Um, it's thought that at a minimum, people should be getting about 50 grams per day. So because their stool and the average American from the lack of fibers dried out on the right side of the colon, they're more likely to form dry stool balls. And you can call them lith means stone. Appendical lith means a stone in the appendix. You know, the stool contains feces, so they're often called fecaliths. Well, the appendix hangs off the bottom of the cecum, the right side of the colon, like a little pinky finger. And if it gets a stone in its um, connection to the cecum, the mucus glands distal to that will continue to secrete mucus and the appendix will stretch until it pops. When it pops, stool leaks into the fat of the abdomen, the mesenteric fat, and it'll cause it to become quite inflamed and be extremely painful. Um, it'll typically form an abscess. Surgical Removal of the appendix includes clipping at its base, and ideally, one can surgically remove it before the appendix perfs. Um, I've seen a lot of perf dependencies, and when they perf, it can be a big disaster. Stool can spill all over the abdomen. I've had to drain numerous abscesses in the same patient from that problem. Okay. In addition, when the stool is dried out, so by the way, normally with a high fiber plant based diet, your defecation will be more like a uh, like a cow patty. And it'll typically be a couple times a day, like let's say an average of about two times a day on a work day and maybe, you know, four times a day on or three or four times a day on a day off. All right. Uh, versus if you're eating, a you know, a high, the sad diet with, you know, high fat and a lack of fiber, there's no fiber in meat and there's very little fiber in processed food. Fiber comes from the cell wall of individual cells. Plant cells always have fiber. Then what happens is your stool gets dried out because of the lack of water from the lack of fiber. And you'll be defecating with, you're making goat pellets or you're making Tootsie Rolls. And you'll typically be straining at defecation. Straining the abdominal muscles at defecation is called a Valsalva maneuver. And when you're doing that every day, there's back pressure every time. And the back pressure pushes into the uh, sigmoid colon here. And it'll cause these uh, diverticuli eventually sometimes to pop. So diverticuli is just the name of the little outpouchings between the muscle layers in the colon. Uh, when they pop, they cause inflammation. Whenever you hear itis, that means inflammation. So you get diverticulitis, and that can also leak quite a bit of stool into the abdomen. In the Western world, there's patients every week in every single Western hospital getting admitted for appendicitis and diverticulitis. They're quite common. Okay, so that's the direct back pressure. You'll also get back pressure from from straining at defecation, the Valsalva maneuver, which pushes the upper part of the stomach into the chest. That's called hiatal hernia. You'll get reflux of acid in there. That's called GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. I'm going to talk about that more in just a little bit, but 
Bottom line is it irritates the mucosal lining of the stomach and the esophagus connection, gastroesophageal junction, GE junction, and it can eventually lead to, you know, first of all, a Barrett's esophagus, ulcerations, pain, and whatnot. It can lead to esophageal cancer. I'm going to come back to that in just a little bit in some detail. All right. Um, other things are the pressure extending downward can push hernias out, and these would be inguinal hernias, groin hernias, right in the umbilicus. I didn't draw the umbilicus in this drawing because it's getting a little too complex, but you'll push hernias out around the umbilicus. We call those periumbilical hernias. You're also going to have downward pressure on the veins in the rectum, and that's associated with rectal hemorrhoids. You'll have more bleeding and defecation when you wipe on the toilet paper. Um, people sometimes freak out about that, and they give it a big workup. Um, you go, you'll also get more down pressure into the veins of the scrotum and the dilated veins in the scrotum because of the back pressure, it's called a varicocele. And those will heat up the testicles and they can cause infertility. So that may surprise some people that, yes, you can get infertility, a guy can, from being constipated. Okay, over here is um, you can get um, varicose veins in the leg because the pressure goes down into the leg veins, uh, the, you know, daily valsalva. And that'll cause varicose veins in the legs. Um, it's the same diet that has a lack of fiber is a high fat diet. Most gallstones, about 95% of them or so, are cholesterol gallstones, excessive cholesterol precipitating in the bile. Um, so these things, they all go together. All right, here is diverticulitis. And what I'm showing you here is, um, is here are the diverticuli, these little air bubbles from extending out from the wall, the sigmoid colon. The sigmoid colon is the last part of the colon before the rectum, okay? And so what happens here is when one of these diverticuli pops, the stool spills out into the mesenteric fat and it causes it to be inflamed. Normal fat is relatively clean, okay? Just It's just low in density because this is a CAT scan. CAT scans are based on density. So this is inflamed fat from diverticulitis due to a perforated sigmoid colon diverticulum. This is a very typical thing. So this by itself is just inflammation. It'll be extremely painful, but on antibiotics and bowel rest, this guy might get better. If there's a big abscess and I got to drain it with a, with a drainage tube, you know, something like a 10 French uh, pigtail catheter. Okay. But if it's, um, if there's active ongoing spillage with free air, you might have to go to open surgical laparotomy and sigmoidectomy. And diverting a uh, diverting uh, colostomy. Okay, oops, I don't need to do that. Oh, I want to go back to presenting. Okay, um, here's a Dennis Burkett quote. He came up with this description of what was called uh, abdominal pressure syndrome because he saw this in the populations of Westerners who were eating the low fiber diets, but he didn't see it in the native populations in Africa where they were eating high fiber diets. All right, so Dennis Burkett said the only way we are going to reduce the frequency of these common Western diseases of the abdomen is to go back to the diet of our ancestors. And he's absolutely right. We're designed to eat plants. It's a species specific diet. This is a good biography of Burkett. I read a couple of books by him and about him. This is, I thought, probably the best one. Okay. Um, next thing we're going to talk about here is fatty liver and fatty pancreas. There's sort of a spectrum of where fat goes. You're supposed to have fat in your subcutaneous areas, and that's your subcutaneous fat. Fat in the areas around the liver and the pancreas um, that's called mesenteric fat, and that's visceral fat. Um, you'll also start to accumulate fat in the liver and later in the pancreas. You'll get fat in the skeletal muscles, that's skeletal muscle fat, and that's the first detectable finding in diabetes. That's the work of Gerald Shulman, for example. And then the next spot you'll get fat accumulation is in the liver, fatty liver. And then that's, so fatty liver, fat in the skeletal muscles, an excessive amount of it, is the first sign of diabetes, and that will that's detectable. Then you'll get you'll get uh, hyperglycemia after eating. Uh, when you start getting more of a fatty liver, you'll trend into getting uh, hyperglycemia during the fasting phase. So postprandial, prandial means to eat. So postprandial is elevated. Postprandial hyperglycemia is elevated blood glucose uh, after eating, and that's what happens with fat in the muscle. When you get fat in the liver, then you get uh, fasting hyperglycemia. So all through the night. You'd be running high uh, blood glucoses. And I see this all the time. More often than not, in a middle-aged and older American, I will see a fatty liver, okay? And once the liver is kind of overflowed with fat, you'll start accumulating more and more fat in the pancreas. And that will then start to injure the pancreatic uh, beta cells and the islets. And those are where the insulin is made. And that will lead to insulin-dependent diabetes. So you want to reverse these problems before all the islet cells, for example, are destroyed and it becomes irreversible and the patient is stuck being insulin-dependent, you know, becoming a little bit almost like a type 1 diabetic. Okay, so here's a CAT scan. And on a CAT scan, normally the liver is more dense than the spleen. 
So in this patient, you can see the liver, the liver is a giant thing, by the way, it's the biggest organ in the abdomen. It's like the biggest single organ in the whole body. It's huge. All right. So the liver normally should be more dense than the spleen. In this case, the liver is less dense than the spleen. HUs are Hounsfield units. Hounsfield units are units of density. So the liver should normally be at least 40 Hounsfield units, and it should be more dense than the spleen. In this case, it's only 15 Hounsfield units of density, and it's much less dense than the spleen. So this is an obvious fatty liver. Okay, And this is how you diagnose it on a CAT scan. Here's how you diagnose fatty liver on an ultrasound. On an ultrasound, so on a liver, on a CAT scan, you're talking about density. When you're looking at an ultrasound, you're talking about echogenicity. How much does the sound waves bounce back? And they bounce back more from fatty tissue than from liquid tissue. The kidney is mostly, you know, a filter bag filtering water. Okay, so the kidney is, is very low in echogenicity. And normally, though, the kidney and the liver are about the same. This patient has a fatty liver because his liver is more hyperechoic than is the kidney. So the way this would typically be read out in a, in a report would be liver with diffuse hyperechogenicity suggestive of fatty liver. Okay, so this is, and by the way, if you hear or see a requisition that says elevated LFTs, liver function tests, you don't even need to look at the films. I can tell you over 95% of the time, the patient's going to have a fatty liver. That's almost always what it is. All right, now this shows how everything is connected. When you eat food, it's absorbed into your blood. It then travels through, let's say, a superior mesenteric vein, and it goes to the portal vein, and then it goes to the liver. And the liver is the metabolic workhorse. It processes everything. Um, the spleen also has blood that drains to the liver, and that's going to become relevant in just a moment. Okay, so fatty liver, what could go wrong? You know, about 20% of patients with NAFLD, that's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, will go on to NASH, okay? Non-alcohol steatohepatitis. And again, the itis is inflammation. And I'm, I'll have a picture of this in just a moment. But to go to inflammation, once you have inflammation, like the hot phase of the disease, it will eventually end up in fibrosis, which is bad. And you got to, ideally, you can clean up small amounts of inflammation, but if there's too much of it, you'll end up in fibrosis. And in that case, it'll progress to cirrhosis. Um, and that's becoming like the most common cause of cirrhosis these days is patients with fatty liver progressing to cirrhosis. It used to totally be alcohol and then hepatitis. And now we're seeing more and more cirrhosis due to fatty liver. And then because the veins are connected, once the liver is all fibrosed, it's harder for the portal vein to get blood into the liver because the liver's fibrosed and sinusoids and the blood can't percolate through there as well. So there's back pressure that pushes blood into the spleen and that will cause the spleen to enlarge. An enlarged spleen can cause what is called hypersplenism, where the spleen starts, normal spleen's job, it's called the graveyard for red blood cells, is to filter out red blood cells. And it can start taking out too many red blood cells, cause anemia. It can take out too many platelets, cause thrombocytopenia, diminish platelets, and put the patient at increased risk to bleed. I saw, I've seen cases where patients had hypersplenism due to fatty liver-induced uh, hypersplenism, and then fall down, hit their head, and get into cranial bleeds. Now, don't get me wrong. That's quite rare. The most common thing we see, and I see this all day long every day, is fatty liver diabetics, okay? And I can tell you, if you told me the patient's 60 years old, by the way, I'm 60 years old. I have zero medical problems. I don't take any pills. I got no problems at all, all right? But if you tell me a regular patient is 60 years old, I don't even look at the chart. It's a safe assumption. They are always hypertensive. They are always diabetic. I just assume that. And they have coronary artery disease and cerebral vascular disease, and they're probably impotent. I don't even need to check the chart. I just know from experience, almost always that is the case. Okay, and this is, again, getting into this thing. You know, doctors Brownlee, Shellman, and Taylor, they did a lot of great research on, on putting this all together. So again, fat accumulation into the skeletal muscle, first detectable finding of insulin resistance, it causes postprandial hyperglycemia, elevated blood glucose after eating. Eventually, the, the liver keeps accumulating more fat, and then now they get fasting hyperglycemia. Then they start accumulating more fat in the pancreas. And then the pancreatic, the pancreatic beta cells, the ones that make insulin, start to die. And now they're on the path to becoming insulin dependent. Initially, it's totally reversible. But once you destroy the pancreatic beta cells, then it's not going to be reversible. And these are some complications of diabetes. Um, I gave a previous lecture about uh, on, on Chef AJ's uh, show for... Um, diabetes for beginners. Well, I go through a lot of the stuff, this pathophysiology in much more detail if you're interested. Okay, now here's what's showing that happens in the liver with fatty liver. You start out just accumulating more and more fat in the liver. And this is non-alcoholic fatty liver. 
And then it'll progress sometimes to steatohepatitis, non-alcohol steatohepatitis. So steato means fat, hepa means liver, you know, hepatic. Okay, and the fibrosis, when it gets extensive, it really damages the liver and, and destroys its function. That's called cirrhosis. Whenever you have scarring, the scarring walls off some normal cells and it hides them in a sense from good blood delivery. When blood delivery means oxygen and glucose delivery, which a cell needs to function. And some cells will transform when they're hypoxic. They don't have enough oxygen. They'll transform by what is called the Warburg effect to a primitive pathway of glycolysis. Glycolysis runs anaerobically, it burns glucose. So cancer cells will often burn through hundred times more glucose than do other cells. And so in a sense, it's like a normal cell in the liver has a lot of work to do. It needs to detoxify all these chemicals in the blood. It needs to manage blood glucose in the fasting phase. It needs to process all the, the food stuffs that come in after a meal. It's very busy. Its main job is to make energy and do its work and produce bile also. But a cancer cell says, screw this, you know, like Johnny Paycheck, take this job and shove it. And it just wants to survive and, and multiply itself like a bacteria. So basically what I'm saying is an aerobic liver cell, when it's hypoxic, will sometimes transform itself into an anaerobic cell, becoming like an anaerobic bacteria. And that's cancer. That's what cancer is all about. And this is going to be relevant because I'm going to show you other places where this happens. And remember, this is the metabolic theory of cancer, the Otto Warburg theory of cancer. He won the Nobel Prize in 1931 by showing that hypoxia injures mitochondria, causing cells to revert to a primitive pathway of anaerobic glycolysis. And I think this is a much better explanation for cancer than is the SMT, the somatic mutation theory, which is what all conventional doctors are taught in school. The Genome Atlas project, in my opinion, is largely just proven uh, the somatic mutation theory. Even though there's some areas where it's still relevant, the metabolic theory is, is the big one. It, it, it tells you what to do and explains things much better. Okay, this is just another diagram showing an anaerobic bacteria burning tons of glucose, a normal cell using oxidative metabolism, which makes tons more ATP, and it's a worker, okay? And then here is a cancer cell whereby the mitochondria was injured by uh, hypoxia, and it reverts to primarily burning glucose anaerobically, okay? And that's called the Warburg effect, okay? We, I, I previously gave a talk on Jeff A. You are going all the details of this, uh, much more detail. Okay, um, fat makes red blood cells stick together. So normally, this is good numbers worth knowing. Red blood cells are about seven microns, and a capillary is only about five microns. So what that means is typically a red blood cell has to deform itself a little bit, fold back on itself to get through that capillary. When you eat a high fat meal, it'll tend to cause what is called blood sludge sticking together the red blood cells. Um, you can sometimes call it rouleau formation, a stack of coins in French. And when all the red blood cells are stuck together, the molecule that sticks them together, like LDL cholesterol will do it. Um, uric acid can do it. Uh, fibrinogen, when it's increased, will do it as well. Then it's like a submarine sandwich. So you have to pump a higher blood pressure to get these blood cells through the capillary. And it's going to decrease oxygen delivery to tissues. So this is partly why uh, high fat diets increase the risk of cancer. Okay, here's showing what the spleen does. So again, I talked about normal capillaries in the body, approximately five microns in diameter. The spleen has some smaller capillaries that are only about three microns in diameter or so. So the older a red blood cell gets, the stiffer it gets. It gets glycated. You also get something called phosphatidyl serine externalization, where it goes from the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane of the red blood cell to the outer leaflet, and that makes the red blood cell more stiff. Plus glycation makes the red blood cell more stiff. So what this means is red blood cells, as they get older, it's harder and harder for them to get through these really small capillaries. It's like doing the limbo, okay? Somebody that's real sort of stiff and unflexible is going to have a hard time getting through. So the, the, the older, stiffer red blood cells, typically about 120 days, again, three months, they're lysed in the spleen and removed uh, from the body. Okay, so when the spleen gets really big, though, now it starts filtering more red blood cells and it can remove them and remove platelets too. So removing the red blood cells makes the patient anemic. Removing the uh, platelets, the clotting cells, can make the patient thrombocytopenic, which penic is like mean diminished. So that's the word for diminished platelets. And then they're at risk to bleed. So these are some of the ways that uh, fatty liver can go. This is what I meant by the liver gets fibrosed. And now the portal venous blood has a hard time getting into it because the hepatic sinusoids are fibrosed. So you get back pressure into the spleen. Spleen enlarges starts filtering more cells more than it should, hypersplenism, subsequent anemia, and thrombocytopenia. That's how it works. Okay, and the reason, too, I went into this was to show you this Warburg effect in metabolic theory of cancer is very useful for thinking about physiology because it can apply in other locations. You can inhale asbestos particles into the lung. They cause a lot of irritation, inflammation. 
then the immune system walls them off. And when it walls them off, it fibrosis around them, creates a scar around them, and some normal lung cells can be trapped in there. Now they're hypoxic and they can transform into cancer. So asbestos uh, increases your risk of cancer. So that same mechanism can occur in the pancreas. So here's an article about non-alcoholic fatty pancreas disease. Notice how this sounds just like the liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver, non-alcoholic fatty pancreas, okay? Normally the pancreas should look a little bit more like it does here in the pancreatic tail. The pancreas, by the way, you can think of it, it looks like a fist punching into the duodenum. They'll get a coronal image, you know, a frontal projection. The pancreatic head's like your fist and it punches the duodenum. And then the pancreatic elbow heads up into the spleen. So this, that would be like the pancreatic tail. So here's the pancreatic tail right near the spleen. Here's like the body of the pancreas. Here's the neck of the pancreas. And the pancreatic head will be right here, but it's a little bit out of plane because it happens at an angle. All right, so what I'm saying is, notice how this pancreatic tail is relatively dense, uniform soft tissue density, similar to the spleen, versus in the, as you get into the pancreatic body neck region, you see more and more fat interspersed with the pancreas. So it's it's going through fatty atrophy, okay? And it's, a lot of times the pancreatic head is quite fatty, uh, trophic in these patients and diabetics, you see that routinely. All right, so non-alcoholic fatty pancreas disease, and it's associated with obesity, fatty liver, insulin resistance, IR for insulin resistance, and diabetes. All these things, they all go together. Okay, excessive fat leads to inflammation in the pancreas, and then that leads to damage of the pancreatic beta cells, leads to diabetes. But what's interesting about this paper is they now talk about, they use, again, these terms are very much like the liver, non-alcoholic fatty pancreas, non-alcoholic steato pancreatitis. So in the liver, it was NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Here it's non-alcoholic steatopancreatitis. All right. And you get progressive fatty atrophy of the pancreas. So instead of going to cirrhosis, it goes to atrophy. And you'll often see like almost entire replacement of the pancreas with fat. But the point is some of that steatopancreatitis is causing inflammation, which is going to lead to fibrosis. The fibrosis is going to trap some normal uh, pancreas cells in there. And those can de-differentiate through Warburg effect and become pancreatic cancer. Now, pancreatic cancer is relatively rare. So everybody always freaks out when you say cancer. Oh, cancer. Oh, my God. Don't worry about cancer so much. Cancer is relatively uncommon. It's relatively uncommon in the pancreas, too. Diabetes and hypertension are off the chart super common. So what I'm saying is if you focus on avoiding diabetes and hypertension, you'll diminish your risk of cancer anyways. And that's where the concentration should be. Okay, okay, so I just wanted to show you this progression like what I showed you, it makes sense for cancer in the lung. It makes sense for cancer in the liver. It makes sense for cancer in the pancreas and it all fits the metabolic theory of cancer. And the beautiful thing about the metabolic theory of cancer, you know exactly what to do. Well, avoid the high fat diet, okay? Isn't that obvious? Avoid the other things that cause insulin resistance. So here's another paper, fatty pancreas centered metabolic basis of pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Okay, so you talk about cancer because that gets all the attention. But the key thing to be aware of is look at the mechanism here. It's the same thing. Start out with a fatty liver. Then you end up with a fatty pancreas. Then you get inflammation in the pancreas. It also causes problems with protein folding. There's the protein folding response and all this stuff. But the bottom line is the fatty accumulation causes inflammation in the pancreas. And that leads to scarring and fibrosis in the pancreas, and that's associated with Warburg effect, and that's associated with increased pancreatic cancer, okay? So basically, you see how these things are all similar? That's going to come back. We're going to talk about, once you understand a basic concept of a mechanism of disease, where did this problem all start from? Too much fat, leading to atherosclerosis, leading to ischemia, leading to all these secondary complications. Ischemia just means like a lack of blood delivery. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about, a little more related to atherosclerosis, and we're going to talk about AAA. A AAA is abdominal aortic aneurysm. And we'll also talk about lumbar spine DDD, degenerative disc disease. And the reason for that is there's blood vessels that come off the posterior part of the aorta. They run at the mid-height of the vertebral body, and those are called the lumbar arteries for the low back, the lumbar spine. And again, symptomatic or abdominal aortic aneurysms that require treatment, they're relatively uncommon. Yeah, everybody looks for them, you know, but it's kind of like saying, oh, shark attack at the beach. Okay, not that many people die from sharks. So it's not so much abdominal aortic aneurysms to worry about. What you worry about is atherosclerosis. And because atherosclerosis, where does atherosclerosis come from? It comes from diabetes and hypertension and high fat diets. So that's what you want to avoid. But I'm just going to tell you, AAA is a common thing to see small. It's real common to see small ones and we'll follow them quite often for years. Uh, the same diet that 
produces hypertension, diabetes, triple A's, fatty liver, gallstones. It also has a high incident of producing kidney stones. Like when I look on follow-ups of patients for kidney stones, let's say they come in for an ultrasound, nephrolithiasis. That's another way to say kidney stone, nephro kidney, lithis stone. Okay. So I almost always see a fatty liver in those same patients. Okay. All right, and what I joke about here too is it reminds me of the movie, The Chronicles of Narnia, where people are being turned to stone. All day long, I see all these calcified arteries, calcified thoracic aorta arch, calcified abdominal aorta, calcified iliac arteries. Wherever I see arteries, I see them calcified, okay? Except for the most distal branches in the brain. All right, so turning to stone, okay? And in the movie Chronicles of Narnia, they had the Snow Queen, uh, the Wicked Witch Snow Queen, she turned everybody to stone, you know, kind of like the Greek mythology Medusa. And what is in real life, you know, it's not so glamorous. You know, in the movies, they make everything kind of glamorous. The queen, you know, the Snow Queen. But in uh, in real life, it's just like a cheese pizza. OK, and, and the reason why I like the metaphor of a cheese pizza is a cheese pizza looks the same on your table as it does inside your arteries. These sort of blobs of fat. Uh, that's a, like a gross inspection of an atherosclerotic plaque. It can often look quite similar to a cheese pizza. Um, and cheese, you can think of it as being like meat jello. And I say when you eat a lot of cheese, you end up looking like the animal where it came from. And, you know, like I said here, a pizza looks the same on your plate as it does in your arteries. Uh, and milk is like liquid meat. Okay, so there's a lot of fat guys walking around who kind of think it's no big deal being fat. They'll say, they'll put their hand on their big belly and say, oh, it's just my beer belly, you know, and they'll call it the apple body shape as a euphemism. But to me, when I see a guy with a big fat belly, to me, he looks like a pregnant female. There's nothing, there's nothing to be proud of. Um, and they often get little uh, man boobs. We call those moobs. And if you look at them on a CAT scan, you'll see there's some breast tissue in there typically. That's gynecomastia, okay? Breast like a woman. That's, that's not what a guy wants, okay? Uh, estrogenic overloaded fat men, because the American population is estrogenic overloaded. And, you know, a woman gets high estrogen when she's pregnant. And I think that makes a lot of women infertile being estrogenic overloaded. But I'm going to show you something else too. Somebody, this was a lady, she wrote a book about Walter Kempner visit. I think her name was Kate Einspaugh. And she called being fat in the modern world, like a fat being like a scarlet letter. And it probably was more when she wrote her book, like around 1990 or something, late 1980s. Uh, nowadays, there's so many fat people. There's not, it's not as embarrassing as it used to be. But she talked about walking around fat. She felt like the fat belly was the scarlet letter fat. Okay. Um, a good comparison, epidemiology comparison, is the Tarahumara. They live in northern Mexico, like the Sierra Madre Mountains, Copper Canyon area. They eat their old-fashioned corn-based diet with some beans, local greens. They're really healthy. They're famous for running over 100 miles in one day. Um, and Nathan Pritikin patterned his diet after them. Okay, so it's a plant-based diet. They're probably about 95% plant-based. All right, and then the Pima was a population in northern Mexico associated with the Tarahumara, you know, genetically the same. And they then, after the Mexican-American War in 1848, went into Arizona and they eat the Western diet, the SAD diet, standard American diet. And they get all the Western diseases, you know. They'll have uh, coronary artery disease, thyroid problems. They end up with cardiac pacemakers, diverticulitis. So these are all the surgical scars that they collect. And they, get, they go blind from cataracts and diabetes and hypertension. And TBI is not just traumatic brain injury. It also means total body ischemia. And I think that's what's happening to those unfortunate patients or some of the sickest people in the world. Lots of diabetes, lots of amputations. Okay, and this is just, you know, Sean, they're for real. A lot of the famous runners like Scott Urich, he's a ultra marathon running legend guy. Ruth Hydras too, the lady who survived breast cancer so far now over about 45 years. She also went out and trained with them, the Tata Humata and ultra marathoners. A couple of books were written about them. There's a guy who wrote him, I think Chris McDougall wrote the book. Yeah, Christopher McDougall, he wrote Born to Run about them. I don't think he's related to Dr. McDougall, but uh, it was a pretty good book. I read the book. Oh, I, I do. I'm doing it the wrong way. I keep doing that. It's a bad habit. All right. Here's a picture of the Tarahumara back in the 1800s. And you look at these guys. They all look real fit. They look like a college wrestling team. <laughs> okay, that's fit guys. And now they're all fat. And, you know, you've seen this slide before, I think. I've added a little bit to it. But basically, you know, by the time, you know, young people don't listen to anybody. And they're kind of think they're immortal because they got a lot of physiologic reserve. But you get more fragile as you get older. By the time you hit middle age, let's say, I don't know how you're going to define middle age. We can say 35. We can say once you got a job and you have to commute to work uh, or you're married, okay, then you're middle age. All right. And you better start getting your health together because otherwise you just go through the usual routine, get fat, sick, and then you're on drug, drug, drug go for surgery, chop, 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 buy by money, dead prematurely. And it's sort of choosing what I would call man's way versus if you go low fat vegan, 
and also avoid some toxins and learn about EMF. Those things are becoming relevant. They're seldom talked about. We talked about those in other lectures. I had other lectures on those topics in Chef AJ's show. Um, all these things, your Johnson will keep working uh, very much, most likely. You know, I'm 60. I don't take any pills. I'm totally fit. I don't have any medical problems, none. Um, you know, get your sunshine, exercise, sleep, social, all this other stuff. You know, religious people are healthier. Okay, great. I call this sort of like God's way. And it's free. Okay. It's free with better outcomes. And you probably live to an average of 90 if nothing else happens. Uh, based on the data of the seven day Adventist. All right. So like what happens to a typical person? I call them an AFC, the average frustrated chump. I got that lecture from the poor, the poor literature, the, the pickup artist literature, you know, the book mystery method. But the joke of it is typical person, you know, they just don't know what to do. They end up on a whole bunch of medicines. The system milks them like a chump, like a cow every day, takes their money. Okay. And here's a good metaphor just to understand what's happening. Imagine you bought a really nice car here. Here's like a Rolls Royce. Okay. And the owner's manual says, you must put premium gas in the Rolls Royce. Well, any smart person is going to put premium gas in the Rolls Royce. Because if you don't put premium gas in there, you're going to mess up the car. There's going to be all kinds of insidious problems that just pop out seemingly random out of nowhere. Okay. And no medical surgical, you know, bullshitology is going to fix that car until you put the right gas in it. And that's kind of what's happening in the modern world. All these people have diabetic diseases and toxicology diseases, and they're trying to treat them with pills and surgery, and you can't fix a diabetic toxicology problem with pills and surgery, okay? So you can slow it down a little bit, but wouldn't you like to cure it? If you catch these diseases early, you can often cure them. The more chronic they are, the more they've done you know, structural damage to your tissue and stuff, and it's harder to completely reverse them. But you can still improve the situation a lot. You know, if you catch it early hypertensive, you could probably cure it. Okay. But if you've had it for, you know, a couple of decades, you might decrease your meds from four to two or four to one or something like that. Okay. Um, abdominal pressure syndrome. We talked about all this. Let's see what I got next here. Oh, I'm going to talk about hiatal hernia. So hiatal hernia is when the stomach pops into the chest because it goes through the diaphragmatic hiatus. Hiatus means like a hole. So that's why it's called a hiatus hernia, herniation through the hiatus. And you're herniating stomach up there. This is a sliding hernia when it just slides up. You can sometimes have it come adjacent and almost be like a double loop. That's a paraesophageal hernia. Okay, well, anyway, I'll just show you some pictures of some. Here is a stomach herniated in the chest. This is a barium swallow or a barium esophagram. And you can see most of the stomach is in the chest on this patient. So you'd even call it almost an intrathoracic stomach. Um, why does it happen? It happens because of uh, abdominal pressure syndrome constipation, valsalva maneuvers, training at the stool can push the stomach into the chest. It'll also happen from obesity, big fat belly pushing on uh, the abdominal cage puts increased weight on their increased pressure. Think about when you're laying supine, for example, and that helps to contribute to working the stomach up into the chest. Um, in addition, a lack of dietary fiber, we talked about the constipation, you get weak ligaments. And some of these processed foods can weaken ligaments. If you think about glyphosate, think about, I like to say it's named glycine phosphate. Its official name is glyphosate. And I get sometimes get viewers who, who write me comments. You're not pronouncing it right. Well, maybe I'm pronouncing it the way I want to because I think that's better, okay? Like Humpty Dumpty. Words mean what I say they mean. And I'm joking, but what I'm saying here is think of it as glycine phosphate. That's a useful way to think of it. Because then you think about collagen. Collagen is 30% of the proteins in the body, about a third of the proteins in the body. It has a three, it's got a triple helix, Okay. So glycine is the smallest amino acid with only hydrogen as a side chain. So it can wrap tight. You can wrap those three protein fibrils around each other tight. Well, when you got a glycine phosphate, a big honking phosphate sitting down there on, in addition to the glycine, and it can substitute into proteins like at every third amino acid uh, residue location, it's going to disrupt that triple helix and make it less effective at doing its job. So that's spray it on all the soy and a lot of other processed foods that are non-organic. They'll even spray it on beans and oats if they're non-organic. Okay, F minus that's in the waters and most municipal water supplies in the USA. That also can disrupt the structure of collagen and weaken ligaments. Things that weaken ligaments can potentially increase the risk of the hiatal hernia. Lack of vitamin C. Vitamin C is also used to make hydroxyproline, and that's you know about almost every third amino acid as well in collagen structure. So you got three triple whammies potentially weakening your ligaments. You can weaken your diaphragmatic muscles from ischemia. Remember, I told you about total body ischemia in people as they get older in Western countries who eat the SAD diet. All of these things can weaken your body's ability to resist the formation of hiatal hernias. Okay, the complications, heartburn discomfort, ulcerations in there. They sometimes call them Cameron ulcers. These ulcerations can bleed. You can get iron deficiency anemia from that. Um, the chronic inflammation leads to secondary scarring, fibrosis, tissue ischemia, and that can then result in a Warburg effect. 
and development of esophageal cancer tend to develop adenocarcinomas. Back when I was a young guy, most common esophageal cancer was smoker drinker cancer, okay, uh, which is squamous cell cancer. But nowadays with all this gastroesophageal reflux, all these fat people, uh, adenocarcinoma is most common type of esophageal cancer. Okay. Rarely you can get other things like you can twist on his pedicle and infarct with the gastric volvulus, but that's rare. I see one of those like every five years. I see esophageal cancer relatively common. Okay. Here's a CAT scan in the coronal plane, meaning the you know front to back projection. And you can see here's the stomach, more than half the stomach's popped up into the chest. When it pops up into the chest, this is actually a paraesophageal mean. A sliding would be just in the, along the long axis of the esophagus and the stomach connection, GE junction, gastroesophageal junction. This is the stomach you know, part of it herniating up adjacent to the regular uh, GE junction. And you can see this big herniation of stomach in the chest is pushing on the left atrium. So that's uh, not, you know, it's not going to help your left atrial filling there. Okay. That's not something you want. Okay. Here is a chest X-ray of a hiatal hernia. You can see it overlapping the heart, projecting over the heart. And you can see there's a fluid level. There's air in the upper part. Here's the fluid level. That's a big hiatal hernia. Again, we're talking about almost an intrathoracic stomach. And they'll sometimes um, have gastric esophageal reflux that'll go up. And if their uh, larynx isn't working as well as it should, they can cough it into their lungs, get an aspiration pneumonia. So here's a patient, you know, a baseline x-ray. They got a big heart for sure. It's more than half the diameter of the side to side chest. This is a chest x-ray. And here this uh, person has now coughed um, their uh, gastric contents into their lung. And that's an aspiration pneumonia. Okay. You can get that aspirating vomit. You can aspirate gastroesophageal reflux. So, um, not good. All right. And then here's the progression of it. This esophagus normally should only be like about five millimeters or so at the most. And here it is. It's all thick, you know, over a centimeter in this dimension. This is esophageal cancer, esophageal carcinoma. And who knows, they might've had an aspiration pneumonia. You got a little bit of lung over here that, you know, it could be atelectasis, just sort of non-aerated lung without necessarily an ammonia, but this could also be a pneumonia. And there's an adjacent pleural effusion, which may or may not be infected septic. Okay, so anyways, this is sort of like end stage complications of uh, hiatal hernia and gastroesophageal reflux, okay? All right, I mean, and don't get me wrong, that doesn't usually happen. There's tons and tons of people with hiatal hernias and gastroesophageal reflux that never progress to esophageal cancer. But what I'm saying is, if I had that, I would just optimize my health in every other way, and then that will be much, 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 much less likely to happen. Okay, some of the other problems, I talked about how the back pressure pushes down into the legs, causes varicose veins. So that's good for the ladies. Remember, they care about that. The guys can become infertile with the varicoceles and everybody can get rectal hemorrhoids. You don't want that. I'll often see the heart. I always see the heart a little bit and I'll see calcified coronary arteries, coronary artery atherosclerosis, CAD, coronary artery disease. Okay. We're talking about gallstones being the same thing, high fat diets, the excessive cholesterol precipitates in there and forms stones. Um, Okay, now we'll talk a little bit about the spine. By the way, I, I've written a couple of books on the spine. This is one of my spine books. Ischemic spine is the most common cause of back pain because I, I figured out there were some papers like back in the 1980s about ischemia, lack of blood supply leading to degeneration of the disc. But I went way beyond that and figured out all of this degenerative spine disease is in part related to ischemia. And I think it's also related, like I just said, to weakening of the ligaments through glyphosate, weakening of the ligaments due to F minus, weakening of the ligaments due to a lack of vitamin C. So here's the abdominal aorta, runs in front of the lumbar spine, gives off a lumbar artery, mid height of the vertebral body, a small twig goes to the upper end plate of the vertebra and the lower end plate. Two adjacent vertebra with the intervening disc is called a spinal segment. When you get a lot of atherosclerosis in the abdominal aorta, you'll stenose or occlude. That means narrow or occlude these lumbar arteries. And then you'll diminish the amount of blood supply coming to the vertebra and even further diminish what goes to the disc. The outer part of the disc is like a steel belted radial tire. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment here. Okay, first of all, let's look at, here's the spine. Typically we're looking at lumbar spine. Usually you count from below with the lumbar spine. So L5 vertebra, L4 vertebra, L3. Okay, then here's the sacrum. You count these like this way, S1, 2, 3. Sacrum vertebra one, sacrum vertebra two and three. All right, typically the L5 is gonna be relatively square shaped or somewhat rectangular shaped. Whereas S1 is gonna be like a trapezoid. It's a angle, almost, almost heading towards being a triangle. So this is a spinal segment, two VBs intervening disc. And here's the lumbar artery, mid-height, giving a twig up and down. Okay, that's your baseline anatomy. Here's a disc, has an outer annulus fibrosis, and has an inner, like a jelly donut, called the nucleus pulposus of the soft material. And what the disc does is it helps to equilibrate the weight distribution when you support a weight, when your body moves. 
and it makes everything work effectively, efficiently. It, it's skillful at equally distributing the weight. Well, when you have ischemia, this outer steel belted radial tire, so to speak, the annulus fibrosis can become partially like infarcted. It means they have a lack of oxygen and blood glucose delivery. It'll crack. And when it cracks, the nucleus pulposus can leak through there. The disc can dry out and lose height. And that's one form of a degenerated disc. You can also get disc herniations where it herniates through there. Here it is herniating into the annulus. That's called an annular fissure. We used to call them annular tear, but annular tear has almost like an implication of an acute event, rupture, trauma, and all that stuff. So they no longer use that. Now the term is annular fissure, a crack in the disc. Okay. It'll dry out, lose height. Um, sometimes this herniation will be big, like squeezing toothpaste out of a toothpaste holder and it can push on the nerve roots in the central spinal canal and cause pain for that reason. This is also what I meant by the upper end plate, lower end plate, part of a vertebra. Okay, the spine, it kind of reminds me like the old uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson quote, he said, a hedgehog is only one trick, but it's the best trick. And so on the spine has only one trick. It lays down calcification and it'll form bone spurs. The calcification ossifies and it'll form a bone, bone spur from the VB below to the VB above. And these are called osteophytes. Osteo meaning bone, fight, you know, something growing out. Um, dish is the name when you have several of them. Dish means diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. So basically the spine tries to fix itself. So if you only have damage at one level of a disc, it'll form a, a, a bridging osteophyte at that level and it'll fuse this vertebra to this vertebra. The problem is people are typically ischemic all the way up and down, have weak ligaments all the way up and down, don't exercise enough, have weak muscles all the way up and down. And you get more and more degenerative disc till it works its way all the way from the sacrum, all the way up to the skull. I'm the one who figured out, though, it's not just isolated degenerative disc disease at one or two or several levels from ischemia. It's everything. It's dish. You'll ossify on the posterior surface of the disc. This is where the posterior longitudinal ligament runs. So that's called OPLL, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. You'll also calcify, ossify the disc and fuse these VBs to each other. That's called interbody fusion. You'll also sometimes ossify the ligamentum flavum back here. And that's called OLF, OLF, ossification of ligamentum flavum. And the spinous processes can also uh, become fused together. And that's called Bostrup's disease. All right. So anyways, so these can fuse right here. That will be called Bostrup's disease when these guys fuse. All right. Here, by the way, is some disc terminology. If the disc herniates into the VB, the vertebra, I call them VB, that's a Schmorl's node. Okay, if it herniates and the height of the disc herniation is only the same as the disc's original height, that's called a protrusion. And it's kind of code word for a small disc herniation. But if a lot of disc herniates out, nucleus pulposus herniates out, and it goes both above the original height of the disc and below the original height of the disc, that's called an extrusion. And again, it's almost like a medical code word for a big disc herniation. And the implication is that this one probably won't need surgery. This one might need surgery. Okay, or be recommended for surgery. Okay, people also often accumulate a lot of fat in their spinal canal. And when excessive, we call that epidural lipomatosis. Okay, and the point I was making is, and I'm the person who figured this all out. There were, there were other people who wrote papers about isolated level, but I figured out it goes all the way, because I looked at many thousands of these. It goes all the way up and down from the sacrum, all the way up to um, the skull. And it, everything's fused. So this is um, DISH, you know, the anterior bridging osteophytes. Um, when they're bulky, I'll call them an osteophyte. When they're sort of narrow, I'll call them syndesmophytes. Um, this is interbody fusion across the disc space. And this is what I meant by OPLL, ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament, because posterior longitudinal lig ligament runs right here. It'll start at the level of the disc, and then it'll extend above and below it. Uh, we most commonly think of it as being cervical, but it happens a lot lumbar. So here's bridging osteophytes working towards each other before they fuse. Here's gaseous disc degeneration, whereby you've got like a nitrogen vacuum effect going into the center of the disc. Here you can see the disc's height has lost all of its height and it's starting to fuse across, you know, from, from vertebra to vertebra. That's interbody fusion because these are vertebral bodies. Um, and this just happens all the way up and down the spine. And initially, eventually the spine gets really fragile uh, because their patient's in pain, they're stiff, they stop exercising, the muscles are weak, they fall down. And these patients sometimes get really severe fractures. They snap like a piece of chalk. They're called chalk stick fractures and they become paraplegic from that. I see, I see somebody get paraplegic from that every couple of months. 
Um, but you know, these old people, they're really weak and fragile. If you have asymmetric stenosis of the lumbar arteries, like let's say the lumbar artery is tight on the patient's left, you can always remember what's right or left. Because when you imagine whenever you look at a film, the patient's putting their feet towards you. So you always go by where the patient's feet are. So if we were looking at a patient, this would be his right foot, this would be his left foot. So this is the left side. And you can see this disc space is narrow here compared to over here. So the implication is that you got stenosis, occlusion of the lumbar artery on this side, but you still got relatively good blood flow on this side. So the disc has failed on one side. Um, you know, other discs, it'll be even both sides, but it'll often see asymmetric failure and that'll cause a degenerative scoliosis. Uh, so that's what that's all about. Okay, we talked now also about kidney stones. Same diet causes kidney stones. You get more calcium in the urine and that's because you got different amino acid composition in meat than you do in plants. In meat, there's more sulfur containing amino acids like methionine and cysteine. And part of their metabolism is to degrade that into sulfuric acid, causes a low-grade metabolic acidosis. The body compensates by excreting hydrogen proteins. Those are, those are acid um, from the kidney. And it simultaneously excretes a calcium when it excretes a proton. So you're excreting more calcium in the urine, and the urine will sometimes then precipitate. The calcium precipitate and form stones. Staying well hydrated can help with that. There's other things you can do. Avoiding caffeine will help with that. Avoiding meat will help with that. Um, avoiding excessive amounts of high fructose corn syrup will help with that. Um, excessive psychological stress makes it all worse too. Okay, so here's a, here's the kidney. Um, here's the kidney collecting system. So the yellow stuff is where the urine is. The orange stuff is the kidney, the filtration uh, component. It filters the blood to make urine. Okay, so this is the calyx. This is the infundibulum. Here is the renal pelvis, it's called, and there's the ureter. So the junction of the ureter and the pelvis is called UPJ, ureteral pelvic junction. Common spot for stones to get stuck. They also commonly get stuck, even more commonly down here, where the ureter joins the uh, urinary bladder. And that's called the UO, ureteral orifice. And stones, typically, if they're like seven millimeters or more, they'll tend to get stuck down here. And then, you know, it takes a pretty fancy procedure to remove the stones. Stones can be really painful. My father had one. He said it was the most painful thing in his life. He said it was like being kicked by a horse. Um, and stones are real common. I see them every day. I see a bunch of patients with kidney stones. Okay, here's a leaky gut. And basically, the most important thing for preventing leaky gut is you eat fiber. You're going to hear all this stuff on the internet. It's going to confuse you. There are only two types of gut bacteria that, that are worth knowing about. There's good gut bacteria that come from eating fiber. And there's bad gut bacteria that come from not eating fiber, plus all these other things that cause leaky gut. Here's a whole list of all the things that cause leaky gut. The reason why fiber protects you from leaky gut is the good bacteria, they take the fiber and they convert it into short chain fatty acids. You'll see this abbreviation all the time, SCFA, short chain fatty acids. The most important one is butyrate, four carbon fatty acids. You can think of like the alkane in organic chemistry, butane, okay? Four carbon fatty acid, butyrate, butyric acid, all right, so anyways, the gut lining cells, the gut's called the enteric tract, so the gut lining cells are called the enterocytes. They will take the butyrate and they use it to make TJs. TJs are tight junctions. And the tight junctions keep these cells held together. And, you know, it's kind of like a line, a phalanx of Greek soldiers, okay, with their shields. Nothing's getting through, and that's what you want. Nothing getting through that's not supposed to get through. And these tight junctions prevent all the problems that you'll think about with, like, autoimmune disease and... Um, inflammation uh, related to leaky gut. Okay, so that's what's supposed to happen. And then bad gut bacteria, they don't care. So our, our good gut bacteria are made to live off the fiber that we eat and they're symbiotic with us, meaning it's a win-win deal. For them living in our, in our gut, that's a good apartment for them. They want us healthy. They wanna keep us healthy and we'll have a nice working relationship with each other. Whereas the bad gut bacteria, they don't give an SHIT about us, okay? They just wanna eat and survive for the moment. So if you don't eat fiber, you can't make these tight junctions effectively and the bad gut bacteria can get across this enterocyte you know, wall of protection. And also their endotoxins, LPS, typically from gram negative bacteria, lipopolysaccharide it's called, or from gram positive bacteria, LTA, lipotychoic acid, will get across the gut wall. And LPS is bad, it's a bad actor. It predisposes to blood clotting, blood thrombosis. It distorts the shape of fibrinogen. I'll show you that in a moment. The blood clotting protein makes it more prone to clotting. That's actually a real big deal. We'll talk about it a little bit later. The other thing I'm showing you here is when you have leaky gut, you can get protein chunks coming across the tight junctions. And when you come across the tight junctions, um, these can be big protein. Normally, you should only absorb one amino acid or two bound to each other, okay, a dipeptide or three bound to each other, a tripeptide, you shouldn't absorb any protein chunks bigger than that. 
when you've got leaky gut with open tight junctions, big chunks of protein can get through there. And that's a problem because your immune system will recognize that protein as being foreign. But let's say it comes from an animal. It'll be foreign enough that the immune system recognizes and produces an antibody to it. But it might be similar enough to your own body that that same antibody cross reacts with tissues in your own body that it's not supposed to. So the fact that that amino acid sequence, because a protein is like a sequence of amino acids, like beads on a string, beads on a necklace. If it attacks that protein and then cross reacts with your body, that's called molecular mimicry with autoantibody, autoimmune against the self, cross reactivity. And this is the main mechanism of autoimmune disease. Okay, so if you want to prevent autoimmune disease, if I had an autoimmune disease, the first thing I would do is look at this list and avoid every single one of these things, okay, to prevent leaky gut. So those are the ways to get you in trouble. And you'll get inflammation on your gut wall, you get irritable bowel syndrome, you can get Crohn's disease, you can get ulcerated colitis, and there's a whole bunch of autoimmune disease. You've heard of all these things, you know, systemic lupus erythematosus, lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, um, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis. There's a whole bunch of them. Polymyalgia rheumatica. Okay, scleroderma, polymyositis, dermatomyositis. It goes on and on. Thyroid diseases, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, Graves thyroiditis, hyperthyrotoxicosis, all this stuff. Hypertoxicosis sounds like expialidocious. Remember that with Mary Poppins? Okay, now looking here is uh, what happens with clotting. This is actually a big deal. Two big researchers did the most work on this are Douglas Kalanethoresia pretorius. Uh, he's a PhD guy out of uh, England. She's from uh, South Africa. So anyways, here it is. Gram negatives producing LPS endotoxin, gram positives, LT endotoxin. So when you got leaky gut, you'll especially get these endotoxins in the blood elevated after eating. So that's called postprandial endotoxemia. And you got fibrinogen. It's a clotting protein in your blood that floats around. And when it interacts with LPS or LTA, they have a tremendous effect on it to cause it to change its shape. Its secondary protein structure is what's called alpha helix, cylindrical. It looks like a slinky, and that's good. That's what it's supposed to be. They will distort it and make a change from alpha helix, cylindrical, the beta pleated sheet, which is flat. And then the beta pleated sheets can stack up with each other. The bigger protein becomes as they stack up and aggregate in solution, aqueous solution, like water, the more likely it is to precipitate out and become solid and non-functional. And they'll actually form these clots that are very resistant to lysis. They're called dense matted deposits. And they float around in your blood and they can plug things up. So you don't want these. You want to minimize these as much as you can. And another thing that's fascinating about these is viral infections can do this. So you'll sometimes hear about virus-related clotting. This is a major thing to be aware of, this concept. And it's, it reminds me also of prion mechanisms, whereby a protein can change its shape and become more prothrombotic more prone to aggregate and thus precipitate out of solution. And beta amyloid is related to this concept of uh, prion disease, okay? Um, excessive amounts of free iron with, with iron overload can lead to reactive oxidative stress and ferrous redox cycling where it cycles back and forth between Fe2 plus Fe3 plus Fe2 plus Fe3 plus and starts handing off electrons to oxygens nearby and they become reactive oxygen species and they can also cause this distortion of fibrinogen. So just trust me, this is also called amyloidogenic. Amyloid is a transformation of a protein from its normal alpha helix cylindrical structure to a completed sheet, flat, stackable, aggregating, sticking together, and thus precipitating out a solution. This is an important mechanism to know about if you want to understand viral clotting. Trust me, it's a big deal. Okay, so here they are. This is Douglas Cal. Here's Etheresia Pretoris. I think these guys both deserve uh, Nobel Prizes. Uh, most of the people who do great research and won't get nothing. <laughs> Somebody who promotes a drug will, you know, get millions of dollars. Okay, so here's a normal blood clot as it's starting to form. And the fibrinogen strands, they're going to look like, and, th and thrombin strands, another clotting protein, they're going to look like uh, pieces of spaghetti. Versus when you get the LPS, LTA, excessive iron, iron overload, or viral proteins, they will then become like dense matted deposits where they become much more irregular and the relevance is that that is a lot harder for us to dissolve because normally there's always some ongoing clotting and dissolution, clotting and dissolution or lysis of the clots. But when they're like this, they're harder for the body to dissolve. So if you have a great excess of these clots, they can go around and start plugging, you know, little capillaries in your brain, plugging up little capillaries in your heart and causing, you know, dysfunction in your brain, dysfunction in your heart. So you don't want this because also, you know, everybody thinks, you know, oh, people die from bleeding. No, in the movies, people die from bleeding. In the real world, they almost always die from clotting. So you don't want this excessive clotting. Again, here's the normal 
thrombin and fibrinogen making spaghetti like clots, all right? And here's a dense matted deposit of irregular aggregations and it's exacerbated, made worse by excessive iron overload, okay? Which comes from what? Gee, like from eating meat and all these processed foods that are iron fortified, okay? Okay, and here's just, you know, an experiment done by, you know, there's Pretorius and there's Kel. And you can see that normal controls don't have this stuff. They're getting the precipitates uh, when they have LPS, you know, bacterial gram-negative bacterial endotoxin, iron overload and iron, you know, from ferrous redox cycling or LTA from gram-positive bacteria, lipotycholic acid. And they're going to form these amyloidogenic clots that are like dense matted deposits because they're precipitates, the amyloidogenic form of the clotting. Okay, and it's almost sense that it can, you know, extend itself like a prion mechanism. A prion mechanism is a protein that can propagate itself. And this is a beautiful work. This is like Nobel Prize deserving work. It's magnificent. There's some of the most uh, cited researchers you'll ever see. Uh, they're, they're actually super famous in the molecular biology world and they deserve to be Etheresia Pretorius and uh, Douglas Kell. Again, he's from England, she's from South Africa. Okay, and so this gets even more interesting. It's associated with cognitive impairment. These clots can lead to worsening of cognitive function. They actually believe that it's a major cause of dementia, okay, in the opinion of Douglas Kell and Etheresia Pretorius, okay? And they've written papers about how they think that this is contributing to it. And they also write papers about dormant bacteria in the blood. So what dormant bacteria in the blood is about, everybody knows you can have a dormant phase of tuberculosis. Everybody knows you can have a dormant phase of syphilis, of Lyme disease and stuff. So if you're iron overloaded and you become iron overloaded, that can reactivate this bacteria. Typically the bacteria can't be active in our blood because they don't have any iron, but people that are having liver damage, you can release the stored liver from there. If you're eating excessive amounts of iron, if your ferritin is overloaded with iron, that's why I try to keep my ferritin low. I wanna keep it between 30 to 80. Mine was originally high, like around 280 because when I was young, I didn't know any better. I ate the iron loaded fortified cereals like raisin bran because i thought that was good i was young and stupid but now that i know better I, i've gradually been getting it down last time i checked mine was about 110 but i want to get it to 30 to 80 you don't want to go below 30 you can potentially get restless legs if you do that okay here's some ulcerative colitis you know thickening of the bowel wall normally the bowel wall should be pretty thin just a couple of millimeters you know like three millimeters or something in the colon but here it's quite thick with these almost like polyps in there you know polyposis um, and you'll notice this patient's got a fatty liver. Look at the liver is less dense than the spleen. Okay. Pretty typical. Relatively young patient, I can tell because the bones are still relatively intact. Older person will typically have a lot of degenerative disease and a much more calcified aorta. Okay. We return to our, our estrogenic man, our pregnant female looking man. Okay. So, oh, by the way, women from the high estrogens, you know, intrinsic estrogens, endogenous estrogen means made by her own body. Exogenous means from chemicals she's exposed to or either in her food or her personal care products like deodorant. The estrogenic effect causes proliferation of the uterine lining cells and that can produce these big fibroids. Fibroids in the muscle of the uterus are called myometrial fibroids. When they project out, the word exophytic means to project from the outer surface of something. So here's an exophytic fibroid. It's a big honk of fibroid. And now you look at this case and you say, oh my goodness, is that a big uterus? Now take a look at this. The patient has a Johnson, okay? That's a giant prostate. This is a huge prostate. This is like the prostate that ate New York City, okay? It's huge. So you can imagine this guy probably wakes up a lot at night to void, all right? Because it's pushing on his uh, his bladder, so he can't hold that much volume in his bladder. So he has to keep on waking up the void. That's not good for his sleep. So basically, I can also tell you, I think I had a little bit of prostate enlargement because I started to have to wake up once a night when I was about 40. Okay, I'm 60 now. And I'm like, uh-oh. And I didn't quite understand it at that time, but then I read about it and I'm like, oh, I see what's happening. So I became, you know, a low fat vegan. I wasn't hundred percent vegan. I was actually uh, a, a lacto vegan for about 15 years before I became hundred percent vegan. And the point I'm getting at though, is because you want to uh, minimize all this estrogenic stuff to help prevent your prostate from getting bigger. All right. I haven't had any, I never got worse from what I started out at 40. So I'm glad for that. It could have been a lot worse. I don't want to end up like this poor guy. All right, so what's the deal with estrogen? Standard endogenous estrogens, the one the body makes are steroid hormones, meaning that they come from a cholesterol backbone. Cholesterol is a lipid molecule with four rings. They're called the A, B, the C, and the D rings. The only ring we care about is the A ring. And in estrogenic hormones, um, you'll have a unique three double bonds in here. That's called an aromatic ring because they smell nice or they smell. They don't always smell nice. Um, benzene 
And it's also called a benzene. So six carbon cyclohexane with three double bonds makes it into a benzene ring, okay, aromatic ring. And then you attach a hydroxyl group on there, also called an alcohol group, and that's antimicrobial. So the relevance is that because these double bonds can resonate, move around these six carbons, there's something called pi electrons that can also run around the six carbons. And electrons like that. They like having freedom to move wherever they feel like it. So this has tremendous shelf life stability. It'll stay on a shelf for years and not spoil. Companies like that. And then the hydroxyl group makes it antimicrobial. It means that it'll kill fungi so you don't get mold growing in the food product. So these things are these aren't everything. It's a great preservative. Think about it. this phenol group. Phenol means the combination of the aromatic ring and the hydroxyl group. Companies are going to put it in, in everything, and they always will. They'll just change some little substitute on it if any one version of it gets banned. Because good shelf life prevents mold growth. Perfect. All right, but I'll, I'm going to teach you something else about fungal inhibitors later too. They're often mitochondria inhibitors. But anyways, that's how it works. Estradiol in the woman means dye is two, all is alcohol group. So there's two alcohols on it. And it's estrogen because it's got the aromatic ring there. Okay, and why does this work in the human body? Because the, the hydrogen on the hydroxyl group of the A ring, it'll form a hydrogen bond with their estrogen receptors. And then it'll activate the estrogen receptors. So anything with a phenol group on it will have a tendency to activate estrogen receptors. You know, evolutionarily in our ancestral past, all these modern chemicals weren't around. So the estrogen receptor is a bit of a, a bit promiscuous. It'll bind to almost anything that looks like a phenol group. Um, again, because it didn't have much natural competition. In the typical scenario you run into, here's something like BPA, bisphenol A. This means two, two things in a chemical that are the same, but not next to each other. So you got a phenol group here and a phenol group. Here. So bis means two, phenol two phenols. And just in the middle, you got three carbons. whoop you do All right. So people said, oh, BPA is bad, bisphenol A. So like, okay, fine. We'll ban bisphenol A. whoop you do They'll just make BPS, put a sulfate in the middle. All right. And so what that means is they can always do this. So you can never really ban these chemicals. All you can do is learn to avoid this stuff. You're wasting your time. You think the companies will ever stop using this stuff. Um, here's another power benzoic acid. We're not going to go into all the chemistry of that, but that's a common thing, like say in a deodorant and people are typically putting a deodorant on and they're getting these estrogenic preservatives plus aluminum is a metalloestrogen. And so what I'm saying is Americans are way overloaded in estrogen. Part of it, I think is, you know, an attempt to sterilize them, but part of it is also just from their own stupidity. They're not aware of these things. Uh, when you drink tap water, it's too expensive to carbon filter all the tap water. So it's full of estrogenic chemicals. You want to at least carbon filter your water to remove it. It's an organic molecule, estrogen, so a carbon filter will, will remove it. In addition, your gut uh, detoxifies your naturally occurring endogenous estrogens. And so what it does is they go to the liver, it conjugates them with something called glucuronic acid. Think of that as being like a glucose with a carboxylic acid you know, gluc like the beginning, gluco, glucose-like. So they'll add that to the estrogen. So here's a glucuronic acid added to the estrogen. They then excrete it into the bile, goes into your, your bowel. Normally we defecate these extra estrogens out of our body and it helps to maintain a lower level of endogenous estrogens in our body. But when you have a lack of dietary fiber and you get all these bad bacteria, the bad bacteria have more of this enzyme called glucuronidase. So what they do is it cuts the conjugation glucuronic acid off the estrogen. And when that happens, the estrogen gets reabsorbed in our blood and the levels go up. Because I've had a couple of ladies tell me every single person in their family, every woman had to get a hysterectomy before the age of 35 because they all had too many fibroid tumors causing them all kinds of problems, pain and excessive menstrual bleeding and whatnot. And when you get a, a fibroid, uh, when you get a hysterectomy at a young age, a woman's blood physiology becomes like a man, all right? So they become prone to hypertension and then all the sequelae of hypertension, congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, and strokes. And the woman, I think, is a little bit less aware because the guy sees all his friends having atherosclerosis problems, whereas the woman maybe doesn't pay attention to it until she's farther along in the spectrum of hypertension-related complications. The reason she gets hypertensive is because bleeding every month protects a woman. It's a therapeutic phlebotomy every month. It lowers her hematocrit, meaning her red blood cell counts in her blood. It means that she's pushing out more immature red blood cells from her bone marrow, meaning less stiff blood vessels. She's got younger, a higher percentage of her red blood cells in her blood are relatively young, meaning that they're more flexible, more deformable. So that lowers her blood pressure. High blood pressure is the number one risk factor for atherosclerosis. So that lowers her risk of atherosclerosis, meaning less heart attacks, less strokes. So that's where that comes from. Okay, so the smart move would be have a carbon filter on your water so you avoid that problem, okay? Eat your dietary fiber so you don't get leaky gut and you have good bacteria so you don't unconjugate the stuff excreted by your liver, okay? Don't use all these personal care products. Like I said before, be simple. Live like Adam and Eve, but keep your indoor heating and plumbing. That's the ideal way to be healthy. Okay, coronary artery calcifications. 
I'll always see, you know, calcified coronaries in almost every patient, you know, at the lower, at the top margin of the film. Um, and the other thing too, people sometimes say, well, I'm going to go get a cardiac calcium CT. My attitude is like, why? Why bother? You know, if you've eaten a Western diet, you're going to have coronary artery disease. Why even check? Why radiate yourself when you don't have to? Okay. Uh, so I think cardiac calcium screening CT is totally overrated. I can tell you, if you ate the sad diet for a decade, you got it. All right. Um, and then I made a little story here, a tale of two patients. Okay. So the first patient we'll call him Mr. AFC, average frustrated chump, cardiac angina, chest pain related to coronary artery atherosclerosis. He's proud of his carnivore diet, thinks it's macho, that he eats meat like a lion does, thinks his beer belly is a joke, even though he looks like a pregnant female, thinks his moves are a joke, even though that means he's got female like breasts with gynecomastia. The Johnson's not working so well. The wife's making fun of him, goes to the cardiologist, gets sent for a stress test. I like McDougal's metaphor, calling it like a conveyor belt to the operating room. It takes you to the cath lab and the cath lab often takes you to the operating room. They pop in a stent, 30,000 bucks. They can't stent the other blockages. They say one's a widow maker near the left main. So they recommend him for cabbage, coronary artery bypass graft. Post out, they run his BP kind of low. Some patients get cognitively slow after that. Um, he's trouble coming off the vent prolonged intubation. They put in a tracheostomy tube in his, in his throat. He has a little small stroke, but not too bad, but he can't eat safely for a while. So they pop in a stomach food, a G tube, gastro tube, gastrostomy tube. They're keeping the epicardial pacemaker wires in there for a while, just in case. Sternotomy site gets infected, osteomyelitis. So we put in a pick line in his arm for antibiotics. He's kind of a MOG, multi-organ failure. You know, he's got poor cardiac output, CHF, congestive heart failure, poor kidney function, acute renal failure. His, his lungs were found he had to be prolonged intubated or respiratory failure got a bit of cognitive impairment brain failure okay so mog multi-organ failure and uh you know then he went and saw a lecture on the internet like mcdougal talking about the zero percent increase in longevity with stenting and um cabbage and elective angina patients not an acute heart failure not in some special situations valve disease can be very good but for routine cardiac angina due to atherosclerosis it's rather overrated in terms of its survival benefits okay so here's a different guy i'm gonna give you a comparison of two patients this guy is developing coronary artery disease and he knows he screwed up he blames it on himself and you want to blame problems on yourself when possible and appropriate because then potentially you could fix it so he starts studying nutrition and health videos online for free he learns about the alcyson diet gets his total cholesterol below 140, his body weight simultaneously optimizes, his flag starts flying again in half mass, his wife's ticked off because he's acting like a newlywed. Um, he's a little frustrated at the grocery store. He's not sure what to buy. He lost so much weight, he has to get new clothes. He's a little bit pissed off about that. Initially, the first couple of weeks, his, he was kind of half and half on the, the old diet and the new one. And he, you know, he gets the farts because his good and bad bacteria are sort of fighting it out for who's going to rule his colon. He had Hershey squirts in his underwear a few times, so he's a little pissed off. Whose problems would you rather have, this guy or this guy, okay? Two cardiac patients. Oh, now I'm going to get into another metaphor. Okay, here's the Last Supper, and there is the the grail, the the, the cup used, okay, to recommend the, the, the wine in a special circumstance, okay? And here's the five wounds of Jesus Christ do. One in each hand, one in each foot, and one in his side, okay? Here's a Roman soldier, Longinus, who pierced his side, okay? And then uh, someone collected the blood from the wound on the side, and that was called the Holy Grail. And the Holy Grail was thought to have magical healing properties. And uh, here's King Arthur's round table, and they were on a quest for the Holy Grail, uh, but only Sir Galahad, who was noble and pure, could find it. Lancelot was probably the best knight, but he had gotten himself into some uh, risky business with Guinevere, so he was no longer felt worthy to find the Grail, only Galahad. All right, well, the reason I'm going into this is there's something else that I call Oh, well, first of all, what's the modern Holy Grail? Potentially a veggie smoothie, but you got to be careful with those. I don't like those blenders because they're too loud, but I, I was just kind of joking about a modern Holy Grail. Make sure you wear ear protectors or you're going to be deaf, okay? All right, so anyways, so what am I talking about here? Why did I go through all that? Because these are what I call the five wounds, just like we had the five wounds of Hazel Christa. We got the five wounds here of uh, what I call the village idiot. If you could fix it as ease easily with a near 100% cure rate, Esselstyn had 99.4% cure rate in four years, with his uh, coronary artery atherosclerosis patients with a low-fat vegan diet, then to go for open-heart surgery is rather stupid. So these are the five wounds. Start out with the cardiac cath in the groin. There's going to be a sheath in the artery, a sheath in the common femoral vein, common femoral artery. You'll have a scar there too. Okay, they'll often use some per close or something device to close the incision site on, on the vessel. Okay, then you're going to go for open-heart surgery. They're going to use a big rotating saw to cut through the sternum. It's called the sternotomy. So you get a big scar right there. 
Uh, they're going to put in a menostinal tube just to drain any potential blood that leaks after the operation if you believe the anastomoses, and that way they can detect it fast. They're going to put a tube, big diameter tube, you know, like about the size of a thumb, you know, centimeter diameter or so. They're going to put one into the chest. So that's the mediastinal and left chest tube. So they got one, two, three, four scars. And they're typically going to go into the right internal jugular vein of the neck and put in a swan gains catheter, pulmonary artery pressure catheter. So those are the five wounds. And I think uh, to go for cabbage when all you got to do is, and 99% of patients or more than that will choose a cabbage over a vegan diet. But to me, it's stupid. So that's why I joke the five wounds of the village idiot. Okay, um, another thing that comes up a lot in the abdomen is screening. This guy, Gilbert Welch, is a real smart epidemiologist, and he wrote a really good book called Overdiagnosed. And he talks about all the things we see on an abdomen CT. There's a joke in medicine. What's the definition of a healthy person? A healthy person is somebody who hasn't gone for a body CT yet. Body CT means chest, abdomen, and pelvis, because there's always a whole bunch of incidental omas. In the abdomen, it's routine. We'll see a kidney cyst. They've turned down the radiation doses on the CAT scanner. So now there's going to be noise inside the cyst. So you sometimes can't tell if it's a complex or a simple benign cyst. So the patient needs a follow-up. Send them for ultrasound, for example. Well, gee, there's a cyst in the liver. Can't tell if it's not a tumor. There's noise in it. Send them for a liver MRI, rule out liver tumor. Oh, gee, there's a cyst in the pancreas, unctionate process, probably an IPMT, introductal papillary mucinous tumor. We're not sure. Send them for a pancreas MRI. Okay. You're going to do all these things. The bowel duct's a little big. Send them for an MRCP. Okay. Um, so the patient gets sent for all this follow-up imaging. Let's say there's very often little micronodules at the lung base, subpleural micronodules, you know, four millimeters or less. Send them for a follow-up CAT scan of the entire chest, and they'll follow those for a minimum of two years. If it's ground glass, they'll follow them sometimes for as long as five years, all right? Um, so what I'm trying to say is all these screening things lead to tons of follow-up that can cause needless anxiety in the patient, can even lead to bankruptcy. Um, so you got to be real careful of these things. You know, mammography. For women who are, you know, less than 50, there's not much benefit. Over 50, you get more benefit, but I'm not going to get into all the pros and cons of screening, but I'm just going to tell you is, you know, just walking into a hospital for a screening test is a much bigger deal than you think. I like a blood test, you know, get a, get your blood pressure checked, get your cholesterol checked, because that's useful information and you haven't immediately committed to a whole bunch of stuff. But I, I would never check my PSA. I just try to keep my pretest probability so low that it's not worth checking. If your pretest probability is, is low, you're more, much more likely to have a false positive. So you don't want to check. Okay. Uh, so anyways, if you're interested in screening, you know, this, this uh, Gilbert Welch guy is, is got a um, really good book here on the subject. Okay. And oh, I won't go any more into screen, but I'm just going to tell you, getting abdominal abdomen CAT scans is a big deal because we usually find some incidental loma, an adrenal nodule. Okay. And most cancers are not, they're not vultures and they're not rabbits, they're turtles, meaning they're slow growing. Here's what screening is really all about. Imagine you got a bunch of people enjoying their day, walking down the, the sidewalk in the mall. And there's a guy from Big Pharma on both stores across the walkway, and they throw a net on the people. Say, okay, I got you now, suckers. Now you're all patients. You're no longer free, healthy citizens. You are all patients, and you're going to start giving us some money. Maybe even the first screening test will be free, but the very often, if you're talking CT scans of the abdomen um, or chest abdomen, pelvis, they're going to end up needing follow-ups, and that's going to make big money. So people who run hospitals, they love screening. Big Pharma loves screening. The more diagnostic testing is going to be the more invasive procedures, and it's going to mean the more drugs and surgeries these patients get, the more money and business for the hospital. Okay, and this is what I meant by cancer. This comes out of George Crow from the Cleveland Clinic. He said, basically, cancers can be three things. They can be a vulture, they can be a turtle, or they can be a rabbit. Imagine you have a farmer who owns this giant farm, like a 100, 100 uh, miles, square miles. And in the center, he's got a fenced-in animal enclosure with vultures, rabbits, and turtles. A vulture would be like a cancer that escapes from the enclosure, flies over the fence, and it's so fast, you can't even screen for it. It happens between screening intervals, and it just kills the patient. Vultures are super rare. You'll almost never see a vulture, okay? You make a movie about it when a young person gets a vulture, but it's super rare. All right, and then a rabbit digs a hole underneath the enclosure fence in the center of the farm, and then it makes a run for the fences, okay? And that's what most people think cancer is. It's a rabbit. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Run and catch him. You know, abandon everything else. Just catch this rabbit. That's all that matters, all right? But actually, most cancer is turtles. And if the turtle somehow, somebody leaves the door open on the enclosure, and it starts walking for the fence, you might as well just forget about it. Let it walk. By the time it gets to the fence, the patient is going to die of something else. So most cancers are turtle. And the relevance is screening discovers a lot of turtles that you wouldn't otherwise know about. 
and they're going to potentially be treated as if they were rabbits. And those treatments might have lots and lots of side effects you don't want. A guy goes for prostate surgery, they yank out his prostate. They often become impotent for that. It can cause pain. It can cause fatigue. It can cause urinary incontinence. No, thank you. I don't check my PSA. I just keep my risk at a minimum. So I'll take my chances. An Ornish study also showed uh, low grade prostate cancer patients can often do very well on a vegetarian diet. That's the Ornish study of prostate cancer with a bunch of biopsy proven prostate cancer who had denied, who had declined initial uh, radiation or surgery. And uh, the ones who went low fat vegan, lower the stress, et cetera, did really well. So I joke that if, if different specialties had a theme song, like for pathology, I, I often, I've done thousands of biopsies, so I'm friends with pathologists. I always joke with them. I go, what's the theme song for pathology? And it's Billy Idol's more, 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 because they always want more specimens, okay? And so I say, what's the theme song for diagnostic radiology? It's Hotel California. You can never leave. We're always going to want to follow up. So it's a bit of a joke, but anybody who's worked in uh CAT scan area knows exactly what I'm talking about there. Okay, so what's the power of this low-fat vegan uh, with no oils and avoiding toxins? It's like the difference between being a Gulliver, a giant of healthcare results, versus being a Lilliputian, okay? Lilliputians, you know, BSing around about all these little micromanagement rules that really don't make much difference versus, that's why I say too, any health coach who seriously studies, you know, nutrition, epidemiology, and toxicology, those are the three things, any team, nutrition, epidemiology, and toxicology is better able to help uh, patients with the chronic Western diseases than is, you know, the head of Harvard internal medicine who doesn't know nutrition, epidemiology, and toxicology, because this is where the disease is coming from. And if you prevent these problems, you, uh, you can slow the progression and sometimes cure these diseases. If you catch them early, you can often cure many of these diseases. Okay. All right. And here's also another metaphor I would give to what this is like. Basically, um, you know, the conventional doctor, man's way of looking at things, look at everything from the outside. Um, they're going to call this D is disease one, D2 is disease two, D3, disease three, disease four. Okay. So these are all common Western chronic diseases, gastroesophageal reflux, GERD, leaky gut, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, constipation, varicose veins, autoimmune, cancer, memory problems. Okay. Et cetera, et cetera. I got 15 diseases here. And what they're going to say is, well, we got a drug for disease number one, a drug for disease number two, a drug for disease number three. Okay. And so here, here's the way they're thinking is disease one, treat with drug one, disease two, drug two, disease nine, drug nine, disease 14, drug 14. So basically their way of thinking about disease is looking from the outside and saying, match the ill to the pill and send a bill. I remember when I was finishing med school, I'm like, this is great. All I got to do is look in my cookbook and match the ill to the pill, send the bill and cures the patient. Everybody's going to be happy. It's great. I'll tell you what it's great for. It's a great way to sell drugs. If each disease is something totally distinct and unrelated and you got a different drug for it, you're going to sell tons of drugs. It's very common. Ask anybody that works in a hospital. It's real common for patients over 60 to be on 10 or more drugs. Common. It's not rare. It's common. Could you imagine having to remember to take 10 things every day? <laughs> I could barely remember to take my B12 once every couple of weeks. All right. It's a great way to sell drugs. But guess what? The patient's never cured. You don't cure a patient of hypertension with drugs. They still got to take the drug the rest of their life. You don't cure them of hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol. They take that drug every day the rest of their life. Okay. Same thing with their diabetes drug every day the rest of their life. And the old saying in conventional medicine is if you cure a patient, you lose a customer. <laughs> There's no incentive whatsoever to cure a, a chronic disease patient. You're getting paid fee for service. Okay. So now I'm going to show you another perspective. It's like the blind leading the blind and they fall into a ditch, okay? That's what happens with this, this not understanding the causes. The conventional doctors, they don't know nutrition, epidemiology, toxicology. They don't know what causes the disease. They don't understand what nutrition to recommend. And they're not aware of the power of epidemiology to help show you what's correct. So what I'm saying is what you want is an individual kind of remember the metaphor of the five blind men and the elephant, okay? So the first guy holds the tail, says, oh, gee, is this a, a rope? OK, and then the next blind man holds the side of it and says it's a wall. Another blind man holds the ear. and He says it's a rug. OK, so the point is each person quite often in conventional medicine has a very uh, like a narrow, thin intelligence, thin spectrum of intelligence. And they only know a small part of the big picture. And what you want to do is kind of step back, read, learn, talk to other people and see the big picture. And so you can see the whole elephant. You want to get a, a view from above, like a bird's eye view. Okay, and these are all different things you can study about a disease, you know, historic history of the disease, epidemiology, animal studies, human research, comparative anatomy, personal experience, biochemistry mechanisms. All right. 
And then you become kind of like this figure as a famous painting by Caspar David Friedrich, Wanderer Above the Sea Fog, where he's looking down as if he's got a bird's eye view on the situation. There's also a form of painting called Romanticism, whereby the human individual is relatively small in, in comparison with the big, powerful uh, landscape. It's kind of beautiful, though. And the fact that the character in the in the painting has their back to you, it kind of draws you into the scene as if you were looking out, as if you were the character or standing next to him looking out over the scene. It's kind of cool. But you want that bird's eye view where you can see all the perspectives. You know, like John Stuart Mill had said, in order for me to understand something well, I need to see it from all the perspectives. You know, so that's why you let people talk, even though their opinion is different than yours, because they might help you. They might be wrong, but even if they're wrong, it helps you to see why they're wrong and to better understand the situation. And so I also joke, this is like the, the joke from the movie Colors, where the young bull, there's two bulls sitting up on, on a hill and they see a bunch of cows down in the field. And the young bull's like, hey, 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 look at all those cows down there. Let's run down there and have sex with one of those cows. And the bull says, the old bull says, let's walk down there and have sex with all of them. Okay. And so what am I getting at? What I'm saying is, if you look at these diseases in a different way, the nutrition perspective, you'll say, well, gee, gastroesophageal reflux, leaky gut, irritable bowel, constipation, varicose veins, most autoimmune disease, they're all caused by the same thing. I'll just make sure I get my dietary fiber. I avoid these things that cause leaky gut, this medication that'll tend to cause it, um, and these other things. And I can minimize all these problems. I'll do it. So with one movement of effort, you're going to minimize all these diseases or prevent them. All right. And then you say, well, look at hypertension, coronary artery disease, type 2 diabetes. They all have the same risk factors. Kidney stones, same risk factors. Osteoporosis, tremendous overlap in risk factors. Gallstones, same thing. Low back pain, degenerative disc disease, same thing. Much of arthritis, same thing. Well, gee, if I just eat the low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet, avoid the animal foods, minimize my dietary sodium, avoid caffeine, filter my bottle, my water, eat organic, avoid these estrogenic chemicals, use less personal care products, filter my water, um, avoid high fructose corn syrup because I'm not, eat, not eating processed food, get my plant things, you know, the, the good stuff from plants, potassium, magnesium, nitrate, precursors for nitric oxide. I can minimize all these diseases, probably prevent them, maybe cure them like the atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease. And I sometimes call this, I learned to call this sometimes God's way of healing. It's cheap, it's free, you got to eat anyways. Why not do it? This doesn't cost you any money and it works better than that match the elder the pill and send the bill. Okay, it's just the intelligent thing to do. There's a little more complexity when you talk about memory problems, cognitive impairment, and then you get into things like um, excitotoxins, um, circa inhibitors, mitochondrial inhibitors. I've talked about this in other lectures. I gave a recent lecture at Chef Ages on this stuff. You can find the link for that. There's a playlist at Chef Ages that has all my lectures. So if you want to go through the other ones, you, you can find them pretty easily. Um, with cancer, it's a little more complicated too. There is such a thing as mutagens. They are real, but there's it, it's a multifactorial thing. But remembering the metabolic theory of cancer, that's what makes you smart on cancer. Okay. And what I say, it comes down to, it's kind of like, uh, like playing a video game, like super Mario brothers, a video game has a character going through an obstacle course. And there's like the green things, the good things you do the green thing and you get energy points, making you more resilient, you know, get your sleep, get along, maintain your social relationships, minimize your stress, get your exercise, get your sunshine, have a sense of purpose, the goals in life, religion often helps people. That's all good. Avoid the bad stuff caffeine, alcohol, staying out all night, working the night shift too often, all that stuff. And because the more things you do that are positive that increase your resilience, the more your body has the capacity to heal whatever disease it encounters, the more your immune system can protect you from infections, can protect you from cancer, the more you can heal any wound that you might have. Okay, so that's the, the video game metaphor. Okay, and then, you know, here it is. This is kind of what it comes down to. Here's the social components that are the base of the of the of the pyramid, so to speak. And here's the starches, here's the fruits, here's the veggies, and here's the B12. The only thing I take is B12. Uh, I, I take um, oral uh, methylcobalamin. Okay, I don't like cyano. I don't want that accumulated in my body. I sometimes call this a Spartan vegan diet. This is sort of my version of it. And, you know, it's pretty much analogous to what a lot of other docs talk: a low fat, 100% vegan, whole foods, no oils, no processed foods. So anyways, I hope that was helpful. That was amazing. Dr. Rogers, have you ever wanted to be a GI doctor? Well, GI is a great field. <laughs> no, it's okay. I like gastroenterologists. They tend to have a real good sense of humor. They're very nice. They're real smart. They're real analytical. But I don't know. I'm just not that enthusiastic about putting tubes up people's butts.
You don't have to do that as a radiologist. Like the, I mean, don't you guys do a test called the lower, well, lower the GI? The barium enemas, yeah. lower GIs. Yeah, I did my share of those when I was a resident. Um, it's pretty much of a rare event. And I would also say colonoscopy is much better than a barium enema. You know, and the reason I'll tell you that same thing, it's much better than an esophagram or an upper GI barium study of the stomach. They are, they're always finding stuff. Okay. We almost never find anything. So we'll only find a big lesion and some, so yeah, I don't, I don't have much to do with that. You know, I sort of went right primarily to imaging guided surgery and then to neuroradiology and I kind of neuroradiology, I think is good for me. Intellectually, it's a lot more interesting than what I was doing as a surgeon, but what I miss as a surgeon is a lot more social. You know, I'm always making rounds. There's always a bunch of people around and it's kind of fun. Whereas with neuro, I spent a lot of time just cranking through films not as social. I mean, a lot of people come to me asking questions, but it's not as social as I'm used to. I, used, I kind of miss that. Uh, well, you should go work at True North. I would love to, if I could work tally, I would, I would sign up with them tomorrow, but I don't want to move to California. I got, I got family, you know, and I got, and I, and I, and I'm, I'm a bit of an old dog. I'm set in my ways. You know, I don't move to California would be a big deal. I'd be by myself out there. Mm. I don't want to do that. Well, maybe I would love do... to work there, but not not by myself out in California. Maybe you could do telehealth. You know that I never heard that word, the Hershey squirts before. That was <laughs> funny. That was funny. Well, a couple of questions. Uh, so, if you don't mind, the first one came in from Donna, and she said she's been eating the starch solution since 2020, and she had her gallbladder out in 2021. She still eats the starch solution, but still eats some processed foods like granola bars and chocolate. Her liver enzymes are normal, but her total bilirubin was 1.9 mg over DL and was having some discomfort in her upper right, upper right quadrant. Primary care sent her for an abdominal ultrasound that said she had fatty liver, then sent her for a fibro scan that said her score was zero. So which test should I believe, the ultrasound or the fibro scan? My cholesterol is 150, triglycerides less than 70, HGB, A1C, is 5.0. I feel like I'm fairly healthy in a normal BMI. So I was a little surprised to be told that I had a fatty liver. Yeah, she might have a mild fatty liver. Most commonly it's diagnosed from ultrasound by showing that the liver is more hyperechoic than the kidney. Sometimes it's kind of a borderline call. Sometimes the tech has a poor window and it's hard to call it and they just say it because they're so used to calling it. But, you know, you can also repeat a test the fact that her hemoglobin A1C was normal, that's reassuring. You know, it's less than 5.5. Um, they might repeat her billy, see if that's a real elevation in bilirubin. Um, you know. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question is from Karen, and she said... She's oh, just... Actually, though, let me, let me go back to that real oh. quick. When somebody's got an elevated bilirubin, you want, that's a pretty small elevation, but you want to figure out if it's real or not. And if you think it's real, then you can say, do I have a problem with hemolysis or red blood cells? So that's a prehepatic problem. Do I have an intrahepatic problem, a liver dysfunction causing this? Do I have a post-hepatic problem? Do I have like an obstructing stone in the common bile duct? Okay. And then you say, well, do I have an, uh, an exogenous toxin? In which case you could have something like tea. There's a tea that, you know, tastes real good. A lot of people like it called rooibos tea, but sometimes these herbal teas can cause uh, liver failure. It's rare, but sometimes they can. Um, cause you know, I, I remember back when I was in college, I took botany. I was considering being a wildlife biologist. And I remember my professor, this old guy, I think his name was Dr. Thomas. Okay. And he says, don't drink herbal tea. It sometimes causes rapid hepatic failure. <laughs> and I was remember when I was a resident, you know, on conference, I remember the conference case and we had this patient sudden fulminant hepatic failure. And we're like, well, what happened? And we go through that whole differential. I just told you, you know, march through all the, the well-known causes. I go, no, it was herbal tea. <laughs> so, um, well, you helped, you helped Jeff do. Nelson when his wife went into liver failure, he did a video about that. Yeah. So that, that can do it. So, you, you know, you, you, you sort of like round up the usual suspects and you go, it ain't one of them. We better keep looking. That, well, you're the, you're the one to call then when we have an, uh, uh, something of unknown origin. That was really awesome. What you did. Uh, so this is from Karen, and she said, I'm 66, female, ate the standard American diet 65 years. I've now switched to 100% low-fat vegan with no overt fats, no oils, nuts, soy, avocado. For the last year I had my lipid panel taken, I was disappointed to see my total cholesterol was 192. I know, Dr. Rogers, you said in your atherosclerosis talk that 
the lipid fats in the artery get reabsorbed by your body when your arteries start cleaning out by a low fat diet or clearing out. Could that be why it was high? Can losing weight also cause more fat in your bloodstream? If so, could it take several years before I get a lower score? And uh, she writes her cholesterol 192, triglycerides 109, HDL 43, VLDL 20, LDL 129. Yeah, it can take a while for your lipids to keep coming down. Um, and some people also, they just seem to run a higher metabolic um, cholesterol level in their blood. If they're doing everything right, they usually tend to do well. That's been the experience of Dr. Ornish and Dr. Esselstein. A um, couple things too, I say also, I make sure that they're following the diet 100%. In my experience, a lot of people will tell you, oh, I'm cutting down on meat, I'm cutting down on oil. And I would call that sort of social thinking. And social thinking doesn't work very well. You know, you want to think biblical. Thou shalt not eat meat. Thou shalt not eat oil. And the reason is, if you only make a small change in your diet, you're only going to get a small benefit probably. You want to make a big dramatic change, and then you're more likely to get a big dramatic improvement. So what I would basically say is, look very carefully at what you're doing. See if you could, you know, tighten it up anymore. And if you're following it well, and, you know, when your body weight stabilizes too, your lipids might keep coming down because you are releasing fat into your blood, you know, that could be part of it. And how long have you followed this way of eating, Dr. Rogers? Well, I've been 100% vegan. I think it's about six years now. Before that, I was about 15 years or so uh, lacto-vegetarian, you know, skim milk only. But then I kept reading about skim milk increasing the risk of prostate cancer. And I'm like, uh oh, no, I don't want that. So uh, I'm glad I finally quit it too. I noticed everything got better when I went 100% vegan. And your health is good? Yeah, I'm 60 years old. I got no problems. I'm strong. I'm skinny. I can concentrate 12 hours in a row real easy because I know a lot of young people, they're like, I've had young people tell me, oh, you know, your, your, your videos are too long. Why don't you make a short? We only watch shorts. I'm like, you know, you guys are 20 years old. They got no concentration. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's... there's going to be an epidemic of dementia and young people pretty soon with all these cell phones that they make people stupid. Well, you know, it opens up voltage gated calcium channels in the brain. It's not good for your brain. If you're going to use those things, use them, you know, hold it away from your body and stuff. But um, anyways, yeah, I've been, I've been real happy with it. Cause, cause sort of, you know, you heard my story. I got fat in my thirties and I couldn't lose the weight for a couple of years. I was pissed off about that. My father was sick with coronary arteries. My mother with cancer. And I, I studied the conventional books backwards and forwards. And the answers aren't there. I got 99s, my medical residency boards. Um, so then I started reading this nutrition stuff and I'm like, holy crap, they're curing diabetics. They're curing hypertensives. They got some of these cancer patients that have lived incredibly long amounts of time. I never see any of this like in the conventional literature. And uh, I was pretty impressed by all that. And you know, Dr. McDougal gave me some good advice. He said, eat starch, which kind of simplifies the problem. And I kept learning more and more about it. And I found out about you and I learned a lot of good stuff. So I was, uh, I'm very happy that, uh, that I got all this stuff. Wow. Are you kind of a lone wolf though, out where you A live? little bit, yeah. And that's another thing too that pisses me off a little bit because like when I was in college, you know, I, I had a, an injury that kind of set back my athletic career as a wrestler. And I sort of vowed, I'm going to someday become a great doctor or a scientist. And so it's sort of like I have become a great doctor, okay? And then conventional medicine, I got all these doctors that come to me for personal advice. So Pete, what do you think I should do? Here's my problem. And here's my mother's problem, my brother, my sister, my friend. And I'm helping all these, these doctors who come to me because for personal advice, they give me lots of compliments, but they will never invite me to speak in front of a conventional audience. And they know it's because their job in conventional medicine is to sell drugs. And so all this, you know, solve your problem on your own and not, you know, sell drugs, that doesn't fly well in conventional medicine. Okay. And also the thing too, is you'll notice there is no research institute for this type of research. Why isn't there a research institute? I've, I've never, ever been called by a research institute that wants my opinion on this sort of stuff. And the reason is because there's no money in it. You look at regular people, they have no money. There's nothing that they could really do. They can pay one fee for a doctor versus big pharma's got billions. Big food has billions. Okay. These device manufacturers, millions and billions of dollars. So they can shape opinion. They can give professorships. They can do all kinds of things, but you know, low fat vegan diet is, is a poor man's game. That's why I still work in conventional medicine. I would love to work in nutritional medicine. I would love to do research. I actually think if there was a think tank, they should hire me. And I'm the kind of person I would read all day long every day. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by this stuff, but there's no money in it. So I work full time in clinical medicine. I just do this stuff as a hobby. Cause I think it's great. Wow. Well, I wish you were practicing lifestyle medicine. You would be fantastic. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. 
Well, Dr. Rogers, thank you so much. Happy Mother's Day, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Doing anything special for the wife today? Oh, oh, believe me, she has it good. She has it real good. Uh, I, you know, I'm pretty passive. Most guys are. I just do whatever the wife wants, you know. All right. Well, that's good. And you know what they say, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. Yeah, it takes too much energy, you know. We've well, got more energy than a man does. You're funny, Dr. Rogers. Well, thank you so much. And thanks, thanks. all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time for Plant-Based Classics with Lauren Burnick. She's going to be making eggplant parmesan. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.